Today we have the uh, honor and distinct pleasure of a uh, visit with Venera DiBella, who has been helping out with memoir writing at the Senior Center, and there's a reason for that, because she has vast experience in the art of memoir writing. So we appreciate you coming to talk to us a little bit about writing and um, and how we can integrate it into our lives. So. Venera, why don't you start by introducing yourself and talk a little bit about how you came to be a memoir, a memoirist. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to know everyone. Uh, well, I uh, used to tell stories. I was a storyteller and I had gone to a couple of storytelling classes and I thought, oh, I can handle this. I can, you know. I can make it up as I go along. Well, I started writing stories about, uh, uh, talking about stories of, uh, the first thing that I did was, f we went on a houseboat and uh, inexperienced people on a houseboat for a week, one with a bad arm and, uh, and uh, a husband that didn't know how to push which button to start the motor. So uh, anyway, it, it was a funny one and a serious one. And, and finally people said, put it down on paper so that we can get an idea what you're talking about. And I thought, well, yeah, let's, so we'll, we'll, who would look at it? I don't know how to write. That was my first sentence. 1995, I wrote it. Oh. Uh, I don't Matt know how Matt. to write was your first sentence. <laughs> it's right. Or is that, and, and, and and that's that, the truth. Because oh, wow. I, and I've learned from that. When you say your first sentence about writing, put it down. Because that's a valuable piece of information right there. It What it says to you, then it opens up that area of you. Uh, Oh, well, I put it on paper, so now let's see what I follow through with. Um, one of my uh, favorite things to do is uh, write without any canceling. Don't, don't cut, um, what do what I want to say? Don't try and correct yourself. Right, do, uh, do a stream of consciousness a little bit. Exactly. So I'm not sure if you have questions or should I... Babylon. Well, I uh, we could start with Babylon. That's a good place to start. So that's going way back, though. I was yeah. just going to go back as far as your family. Did you grow up with storytellers? Uh, yes, my father was a storyteller, and, and he came from Italy. And uh, there is a type of singing that in this country we call cow uh, the cowboy western ballads. In Italy. In Sicily, there's a what they call a stornelli, and you sing it, and there's a certain melody that goes with it. But anyway, and you make it up as you see. Oh, if you see uh, Reed, and you talk about Reed, and then you can go to Lois, and you tell another story about Lois, and uh, all the time maybe strumming a mandolin. Which is kind of an interesting way of doing it. You're, you're, you have the uh, music pushing you and uh, words come out. You know, it doesn't have to rhyme. Uh, thank God we got away from rhyming. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that... We can talk more freely now. <laughs> so did you ever do that uh, singing? I did not, uh, but my father did. Right. He was very good at it, and uh, uh, I always think that I'm going to be as good as him, but I'm not going to make it. I'm not, you know. So when so, you were doing, so when you were doing storytelling, uh, yeah. uh, what was the venue for that? Was that I know that there's a you know sort of a tradition of uh, of and groups of people who get together to tell stories. Is that was it an organized thing like that, or were you more just a <laughs> A rock and yeah. tour. <laughs> well, it started out innocently, you know, how that goes. And someone said, why don't you join that 
storytelling class. And the, by the way, that is a wonderful thing if you can put it together because many people are good storytellers. And uh, it doesn't matter if you make it up or what. It's just the way it should be. And um, if you have the animation in you and the passion of, of what's going on, it comes out. Um, I don't believe in writer's block because I think there's something to be said all the time. Well, and that, I guess, goes to your stream of consciousness. So where we got to this was somebody telling you, put down some of these stories. And so you started a sentence. I did. And then it started when, I'll tell you an awful story. This, when I was 15, I decided I was going to be an author. How do you become an author when you don't know what you're doing? So I saved my money, bought a little typewriter, a little old royal typewriter. And uh, I figured that's a good start. I'm probably halfway there already. And I like to go to the uh, library and read pirate stories, which were very popular when I was growing up. Uh, uh, Errol Flynn did help me a lot on that one. And uh, at 15, the, uh, the juices were starting to flow in my head. I figured, I can do this. Oh, my gosh. So what did I do? I went to the library, picked up a bunch of books, brought them all home. And I took the first sentence out of one book and I put it down. I went and took another sentence out. And after a word, I had three pages of somebody else's words. <laughs> Nothing did I know of what is not proper? And that was, the, my plagiarism was innocent. That's right. Yeah. So I still have that book that I started and I copied every one of them. But what's funny about that is that I looked at it and I said, I don't talk like that. <laughs> and suddenly, I started understanding what I need to do was to listen to and read a lot of books and see how people talk and how they put it down. So, Daddy, do have any questions? Go well, ahead. I want to oh, ask you. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I want to ask you about your uh, your memoir, marriage, kidneys, and other dark organs. How you came to put that down? This is the book. It only took eight years to write. <laughs> and uh, what happened was with the, the houseboat, I suddenly started writing that. And I just moved up, up here from Southern California. And, uh, you know, they told me, go back to California in those days. I said, I thought this was the land of authors. That's why I came here. <laughs> That's right. And this is the island in the land of authors. The That's island right. of authors. I really love it. And it is, there's truth about it. These beautiful trees and things like that are very, ex very exciting to write around. And uh, to sit in a room that you've selected in your home. Um, I believe make it a sanctuary. I also believe that we don't respect our work too much. I've, what I've noticed when I have had classes, people will say to me, I don't write. Oh, I says, that's baloney. You, you write every day. And, uh, and we then started it. Um, so I did join a writer's group who were all top bananas and I was the bottom of the totem pole. I was very glad to be there because they taught me everything. And so so and where was this writer's group? Was that right here on the island? And it was fabulous. Uh there was uh uh she has since passed away, Barbara Winthers. Uh, is a very good uh, uh, writer and uh, 
she said to me, when I first started going, she said, too many commas. I said, yep. And I wasn't going to answer back because I figured she'd do it all. Then somebody else who was even smarter than her started saying, too many short sentences. You don't finish your sentences. I said, that's how I talk. I don't know what else to do. I guess I can put an and in there and no periods. And uh, it became quite an, a, a thing to write. Then my friend who was writing uh, fiction, uh, his name is Dave Cragen, and he, he writes great science fiction. And uh, he says, wait a minute, he said, that's her voice right there. That's what she, how she sounds, and that's how she should put it down. And I really appreciated that person saying that to me. And that you defended me like that. Uh, he became my agent for my second book. And we have a good laugh about it. He calls me like every three months and he says, Venera, we have royalty for you. Uh, I think we have just enough for two cups of coffee. I'll meet you down at the, uh, um, the uh, shop downtown. And I <laughs> said, we've got that much. I can't believe it. So, so is that the, is that the, uh, the, the, the book, They Were Holding Hands? Yes. That's uh, my favorite. I feel good about that because I hadn't written any fiction. And... Um, Excuse <laughs> my my breathing is a little off today, um, but um, whatever you write, I I like short stories. Um, anyway, so so did you find it easier? Do you think that memoir is a good way to? uh to sort of get started you were talking about stream of consciousness and you know people always say write what you know obviously you yes. should know at least something about your your own experience it's very much so i feel very strong about memoirs because and we are in a senior center and when they come through those doors they're anonymous until we know who you are and we start knowing who you are through the different classes you take. But writing a memoir just suddenly tells you, ah, this woman, this man lived these, these pieces. Look at that. And we would not have known about you. And um, one of my fears in life is being anonymous not having any legacy it, it, it's to me not to you that i care about it uh i i'm i'm not a morbid person but i'm not a, afraid of death because i wrote a book and it's so funny that i attach it to that mm -hmm. um there is Something I wrote in the front of the book that I need to read to you. We must tell the children, tell them of the stories of the land we left behind. Tell them what we have had to endure and overcome and triumph. We must tell them so they can really know who they are. And uh, that to me meant a great deal to write them for my family, but you know, they're the last to want to read these. You well, one of the challenges when you're, you know, thinking about writing about your own life is that where do I start? What do I leave in? What do I take out? When you are advising people about memoir, how do you get them to think about it in a smaller way to get started? You know, rather than trying to boil the ocean of their life. No, you can't do that. And you pick, the way I wrote my book, I had a theme for it. And I, and my bobbing heads, I understand these are some of the students 
Lois is a, a, one of my students, Catherine and, and Jim. And we, I told them, you pick something that you feel that is a, is part of you. I used love as the theme of my book, how it was given, how it was taken away, how it was misused, and and just any way you see it, how, how it was used against you or for you. So what happened was, is I picked out people in my family and I may not have known them that well. I, I've got one story where I wrote about Ed's, my husband Ed's uncle. He was kind of a funny man. And uh, he just, uh, he just, uh, you could not put your finger on who he was, but he was suspicious of people. But a sweet man, you had to see through that. I looked at him and met him only a couple of times and he had a twinkle in his eye and I was a young woman and there was something about him. Well, he ended up being someone that gathers things all through his life and put them in a warehouse. He had a, a salvage yard, a warehouse, he was a collector. Some of them would call him a hoarder, but he was wh who he was. In this story tells us who he was only from my point of view. That's all I have. If I write a story about anyone, if I wrote it about Catherine, I would have to know her from where I sit and look at her. One of the main things you use are photographs. Um, look at those photographs. Look at the eyes of people. Look at their mouths. And read the story. You make up the story, what you see in that picture. Because that tells you everything. You cannot hide feelings on a face. I, I know people try. Um, let me see. I don't know if well, I answered you. Well, so just to follow up on that a little bit, it sounds like I remember taking a, a reading the book, drawing from the right side of the brain, and the yeah. idea of of drawing without um, drawing the line that you see rather than the abstract imagination of what's there. So, writing a memoir or writing in general, it sounds like can never be objective and in fact that could be the hardest that could be the biggest uh um obstacle to getting it right is to try to be objective yes um i didn't i i, I was lucky not being schooled in this in this stuff because mine was purist type stuff uh i wrote it uh, if it sounded all right to me that's all i cared about that's kind of a selfish mode, but the, I have to look at it that way. Um, I was, I put music on because I wanted to feel, I wanted to get close to tears. It sounds like it's harsh. It's not harsh. I wanted to write about my mother who I had a bad, uh, bad uh, feelings with. And to really understand her through the writing it happened i put willie nelson on and he was singing a song angels flying too close to the ground and it reminded me of her so i brought that out to myself and i said my god they even wrote a song about her and <laughs> And that she, she came alive again to me because of that. Um, I have a, a story in there about mother. And I, 
find that I name the, the story first before I write the, the, the story. I, it, it can go in any direction, but that's what I did. I called it, Just Tell Me You Love Me. And when I sat there and started writing, I imagined that scene that I was in the day that I felt that. I could be in the room with her and she'd never talk to me. Didn't ask me anything. Didn't care if I was there or not. Only if I bothered her, she would look at me and say, why don't you just leave me alone? And uh, I, I, I could not reach her. And I'm, I probably will go to my death without understanding her fully. But it's okay. These are the things, the richness of a memoir. It puts to bed struggles you may have had. I've been in therapy many parts of my life. Nothing served me as well as the memoir. That's 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 quite a quite a statement there. Yes, it is because there is no way to hide from my words anymore. And there are days when I want to, but because it's down, I look at it and read it and say, "So what." She did the best she could. I'm doing the best I can. Maybe somebody will write something about me someday. Well, we and, have a few people who are here who very well might because they've spent some time with you in your classes. And I want to make sure that if somebody has a comment or a question for Venera, they uh, feel free to open up their microphones. Lynn Murphy has put several questions in the chat. Uh, oh, she, hey. she was asking... Um, First, um, the author of the front piece of the quote that you made, at the, that you read for us? Yes. That was from, uh, uh, it was on NPR many years ago. And uh, I did, uh, it was a piece, I think, was talking about uh, immigrants. And uh, so I, I took that one and um, I don't know if I, I think I may have, yes, I said it was a public television series in 1999. We must tell the children Italian Americans to a beautiful song. So I, I, I gave them credit for that. But these are things that, go ahead, I don't, I, I'll stop. Okay. Well, okay. Another. So she then asks if you're still writing, and if so, do you have something specific in the works, or are you writing uh, individual pieces that are not strung together at this point? I always write short stories, but I haven't been writing much. I have to tell you, I'm an I'm I'm an, been accused of being a, a bad woman because I go on Facebook and write a lot of stuff there. But I get off um, uh, my uh, disappointments there. I give out my opinions there. I have a need to write. I know that. And so uh, some of them are worthwhile <laughs> and some aren't. <laughs> Uh, Lynn also follows that with uh, when you say that writing a memoir involves others of your family and you're also talking about public comments on Facebook, uh, some of those family members may not look on your comments, opinions, or writing favorably. How do you deal with that? Yeah, tough cookies on that one. But I am careful. I didn't write while my mother and father were alive. I didn't want to do that. Because I was quite honest about how I was treated. But I also know I love them both a lot. Um, and I, and I, I have to say, I had an experience 
last week in my wife's folks uh, with the two gentlemen that uh, came to my group and said they were starting to t talk to me and they uh, and one man said I don't know why we uh, you know men don't seem to have a job anymore you know I said because why because you you got too much thinking about power and money there's something in between we do need you what is wrong with you and uh, I said for one thing I could not be sitting here talking to you if it hadn't been for my father. My father gave me the right to speak out like this, not my mother. And I'll always be beholden to him uh, about that, even though he was hard on me. Um, so, boy, do I get far off beam. <laughs> Well, I guess I guess we're talking a little bit about uh, living with the consequences of your writing, and oh. in some cases, uh, obviously, your parents you sort of decided not to at least publish those things yeah. until they were not around to read them. Exactly. But what, what about what, what what about your husband and your 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 uh, your daughter? I I most of it was about Ed because he had. I mean, he had a style of life that he could get into more troubles and they were so humorous that I mean, I'd be a fool not to pick up on some of that. And I asked him, I said, do you mind if I write about it? Oh, no. I mean, he didn't know what I was going to do, well, you know, but he came home with the stories. You know, don't tell me them and don't put me in front of you. He goes to work in a three-piece suit, carries a briefcase, and gets locked in in a bathroom, in this private bathroom. And he, and he can't get out. He takes off his shoe and he's banging on this bathroom door. The, the cleaning people have locked him in. He was convinced. And they, suddenly, behind him come the two men that... The, What's the matter, mister? They looked at him like he was having a apoplexy coming through. So he said, you locked me in. And it's a Friday and I'll be here all weekend. What's wrong with you? He said, no, sir, you're banging on the cleaning closet door. So, <laughs> you know, why wouldn't I write about that? I mean, all right. seriously. Thank you. Any other questions from those of you who have enjoyed Venera's classes uh, in memoir? Or uh, I know you also are giving a regular get together that's called Wise Folks, that uh, is an opportunity to converse, converse. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that. But first, is there anybody who has a comment? Venera? Um, yes. My, my, my husband's uh, grandfather was a prolific writer. And apparently he wrote a lot, didn't have it published, but didn't share it with the family either. And uh, uh, nobody really read this stuff until Bob inherited it. And his parents have since passed. And of course, the grandparents have passed. And so we thought, oh, this is great. So we, we Bob says, let's make copies, give it to the grandkids. This will be wonderful. And we started reading it. And some of it was just hilarious and wonderful. And some of it was extremely racist. <laughs> and it was at that time, you know, that apparently it was, uh, you know, pretty common. And, you know, I, he's been in a dilemma of whether to share that with them or not. And uh, I don't know. What would you do? Uh, you know, I, I leave that in there. If we can't rise above... You have to learn it from something. Mm -hmm. He didn't just grow up, suddenly said, I think I'll be a racist today. No, he just learned it. He picked it up. He did. And, learned it. and that, it's how we write it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I've, I've tell everyone this little line. I say, if you want to tell somebody to go to hell, tell them in a very nice way 
and they might just go. <laughs> so, you know, uh, you've got the advantage. You've got the pen in your hand. Play that game to the hilt. L and don't be afraid to put your own feelings in books and stories. I have a method that I use of a talent when I'm thinking out in, in about what I just wrote in the paragraph before, you know, I say, well, well, who wants to know about that? And now, you know, you have to talk out loud. Uh, that's why it's so exciting. You have total control of this piece of paper and pencil. So, uh, so do you, do you, uh, do you, um, edit yourself by hearing yourself read what you've written out loud? I can't stand to hear myself read. I can't stand it, but I do. Microphones are, uh, what do they call them? Recording machines. If you can read your stories in your, in a recording machine, you will be surprised what you will do afterwards. I, I mean, short of suicide, you know, you want to do it. But humor is a wonderful way to talk about tragedy. Mm. Mm. So if the racist guy, give him a laughing line and we'll see what we could do. You then can correct it underneath and say, ooh, yeah. I think I want to hear that again. Yeah. I, I, okay. I will let Bob know that and uh, yeah, I mean, add his own footnotes or little suggestions. By the way, making copies. <laughs> I think it's well worth your trouble to put photographs in your memoirs. Because when you write a story, people love to look at that person that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they look at them and they say, that little pipsqueak said that. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and uh, so it, it's a wonderful avenue. Read memoirs. Read them. Because no one, uh, even with my short sentences, they're like, it's amazing. Thanks, Vanira. My pleasure. My pleasure. So, what else, Reed? Well, I'm going to see if anyone else has a comment. I see, uh, Lois, you have your microphone open. Do you have any observations of uh, what you've learned or uh, <laughs> uh, what you've taken away from your uh, classes with Vanira? Sure. Don't, don't forget I paid you well. I <laughs> well, I think one of the, um, just from a, a organization perspective, Venera was very helpful. Um, when you start out writing a memoir, it's helpful to, number one, have a theme. Like she said, hers was love. Mine are all stories of survival, how you overcome adversity and what happens as a result of that. Um, other people in our group had different objectives. Um, one gal was writing stories um, for her grandchildren to read. I wasn't writing for anybody to read. I was just writing to remember my life and write it down. And I, I think that's very freeing because I'm more willing to put in uncomfortable things about people and experiences than somebody who's writing for their grandchildren to read. But Venera is very good at saying it doesn't matter who the audience is, it has to contain truth and it has to be about you and your life and you don't want people to have the wrong impression of who you were or it's important for them to understand why you are the way you are or were the way you were. And so that was very helpful as having a theme. Um, and then you can find stories all around like me. It's like, oh, about the time I survived the blizzard or the time I survived a divorce or the time, you know, you survived some kind of health issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, it helps to spur your mind about 
stories that you might think you had forgotten. The other thing that was important, and I didn't do it, and I regret that I didn't do it at the beginning, was to put together a notebook and on each page have like a uh, an era, like childhood, young adulthood, you know, career. And that helps to organize your stories if you decide later on to put them together in some kind of a manuscript or a book. And I found I just started writing and um, it worked out okay in the beginning, but after I had about a hundred stories, I realized that there were re repetitions and overlaps that probably wouldn't have happened had I listened to Venera and was a little bit more organized in the beginning. So Venera, can you tell us a little bit? about yeah, that really, idea of the notebook yeah um i'm really uh feel strong about how you set yourself up in a, your rooms or wherever you are that uh you have to build uh almost like a little sanctuary for yourself and, and it may sound trite but it's so important most people who write don't respect themselves and it, let's make believe you're going to write this story for the lady who's hiring you across the street. That way, you'll go in and you'll write. You are most likely to write if you know somebody else is expecting you to. So I uh, set up things like this. I get a three ring binder. And I put on the first year I was born on one page, go right up to 19 or 2000, whatever the heck we're in, to 2020. Uh, and that's where you start writing in there. Oh, I was born in 1932. Oh, yeah, mom was having a bad day that day because she says I was a breech birth. And by God, I may almost killed her. Well, you know, that's not funny, but it is a good reminder of how I feel at that point. To write it down, little hints that happened during 1932 that you remember. Keep going. Every time you think of, oh, the family had a huge accident in 1945. Oh my gosh. Error, the car got destroyed and everybody was okay, but boy, what, what we went through. Uh, so you that's one tool. Another tool is um, mm, let me just go through this. Let's see. There is always line yourself up with decent books. One of the best things you can own when you're writing is a good synonym book. You know, oh, if you're going to say, he said, she said, you know, but, uh, you're going to die on the vine. You have to get them up and be a little bit more exciting with that. Uh, doesn't mean you have to come up with them these words that are so long you can't remember how to spell them anymore but you you know yourself it's going to sound like you i once read a book uh uh of member sisters who were uh in their uh well i think about 85 90 years old they wrote <laughs> And they were the worst sounding words. And I mean, they were just scrambled. It was such a revelation. You could tell when you finished this book, what these people sounded like. Like they were sitting there telling you their story. So it built over time. It got stronger as you read it. You started yes. to understand what was going on and... And that's what you learn about books. I mean, I don't know about uh, if you're all readers. I used to be a very heavy true crime reader. How about that? At 14, 
buying detective magazines uh, who were, wrote the lousiest words on earth. But I wanted to know what it was that makes people tick. And that's, I think, helped me find out that everybody's got a story. So I'm, I'm going to ask our audience here if any of you have uh, any wisdom about your experience with trying to write or any um, hurdles that you have encountered that um, you'd like Venera's wisdom on. You're smart. <laughs> I'm looking to see if anybody is going to unmute well, I'll, themselves. I'll add, I'll add one thing that okay. Venera... The Venera help. Sometimes people don't know what to be, how to begin, or what to write about. And at the beginning of her first class, she handed out a sheet, and it had topics, and you know, like my first car, or you know, my second grade teacher, or whatever, and just you know, a whole list of things that if you don't know what to write about or how to start. There, I don't know if there's a way, Venera, you can share well, that with, with the uh, There is. I wrote a story, and and I have to toot my own horn on this one because I didn't think I could do it. And it was, they they handed out all, all these things down at that uh, writer's group I had, and I picked a spider. Mm. Give him a life. So I gave this lovely spider a life. Uh, and uh, he was married, and he lived in a boot in New York City. So, I mean, he had an accent, too, you know. So he had friends. They'd all go up to Albany, up north, and have a vacation in the, you know, around the, uh, the outhouses there and stuff like that. And they just had a blast, you know. They would get on a bus. And they lived under the seats, you know, until they got there, you know. And they said, this is the life. We don't even have to pay. Look at those people up on the top there. They're going to pay. And I don't have to pay. And it was so much fun doing that because you just let yourself go. You get so crazy and stupid and, and uh, magical. Think about how you perform magic. Anyway, I've had that. Uh, it's, I ought to read it someday. New York story. I think I did read it to you, Lois, uh, when you were in class. And um, that's it. That's it. So, I, you know, I know that uh, you have given probably four series of classes in the last few years, maybe more. Uh, uh -huh. I look forward, I look forward to, to the time when we can do that again. Uh, right, right now, you're now doing you're a group. Doing group called Wise Folks. Can you tell us a little bit about what that group is? Well, Wise Folks started out because I run, I've been running a support group at my home since 1989. Oh, just women. Uh, I wouldn't have minded having men there, but you guys are a little bit more chicken about this thing. So, but you're all right. You're learning. You know, Another hundred years, I figure you'll have it done. Um, I like uh, knowing about people. I like to see people tell the truth about themselves. I'm very much tight about that. So what I do in Wise Folks is, is I'll have maybe a, a subject. Uh, okay, when did you get your first spanking? Uh, and there's dead silence in the room. So we always have a few that open up better than others, you know, and they help others. But that's our, our, our theme in there is to turn up the things that we don't normally talk about. How do we feel about when we're low of money? How do we feel when we're getting old? Uh, who are you? Who are you? Well, I don't know how to answer that. I used to run a, a factory and we made uh, uh, 
tools and things like that. So I said, do you ever tell anybody any of this stuff? One day we had a wonderful thing happen. A giant of a man sat at one end of this 20, there was about 20 to 25 people in the class. And he says, I often think about holding a baby. Now, I got to tell you, there was a, a dry eye around there for a while. Because he said what came from the bottom there inside and said what he wanted. He had, you know, by his admitting his truth, he gave a permission to everyone in that room to say how they felt. Many said, I would love to rock a baby again. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm not writing a book about them, thank goodness, because uh, I they probably get me and tie me up and burn me. <laughs> but no, that's, well, that's it. Yeah, but that's uh, again uh, your your conversation about truth and and love. I think always uh, we and men are so good in these groups. They just don't realize how good they really are. And I, uh, don't you feel that way, Jim? Venera, you know I love you. <laughs> I listen, don't tell my husband he just can't stand that. Well, I said that in front of him, so it doesn't make any difference to me. That's all right, then. So, so I mean, I, I think you really find out who you are when you're in this class. And I'm sorry that I'm unable at this point to come over to it. So, and I miss you very much, but. Uh, I miss you too. I think and whether you're you're experiencing your writing classes or your uh, 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 wise you, folks, you, yeah. you really begun to feel you know, and understand who you are yourself, and that's very yeah. important to me. Well, I want to. I do want to thank you uh, for taking the time to talk through these uh, both these subjects and really giving us some uh, some uh, both your own experience of breaking through the barrier of um of reticence to write and some tips and uh and tricks to trick your mind into getting you going and also um i think that we should look at ways that we can continue to connect over the uh over the internet as well as in person and we are you are doing wise folks uh get togethers in person uh yeah. lynn murphy says one more time woohoo venera you <laughs> always make us smile Thank and you. Thank you. Well, you all make me smile. Sure you've got.